In the 17th and 18th centuries, ice was a problem for scientists. There was enough of it about. Throughout most of this period, the winters were harsh and the rivers of Great Britain froze so hard and thick that winter fairs could be held on them, as per these images of the Thames. Things sometimes got a little out of hand as this cartoon by the famous cartoonist Cruikshank shows. Now, the premier scientific body of the day was the Royal Society. Begun as an informal club for like-minded people, it was officially constituted in 1660 and was given a royal charter by King Charles II in 1663 as the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge. And in the mid-1700s, it was very much involved in voyages of exploration, along with bodies such as the Board of Longitude, who were busy evaluating methods for pinpointing a ship's position at sea. And at this point, ice was very much on the society's mind. It was, of course, clear to them that ice was frozen water, and that any body of water would freeze, provided it wasn't salty. The Thames froze at London, but as you got further into the tidal estuary and out to sea, it didn't freeze. Salt was the thing. Basically, salt, no ice. They already knew there was a permanent ice cap towards the North Pole from the stories of fishermen and whalers, and they knew that this ice cap fluctuated summer and winter and from year to year, but the fact that there was an ice cap meant only one thing to them. This ice must be created by the output of fresh water from huge rivers flowing from a landmass at the pole. Now, 1773, Captain Cook is on his second voyage of exploration searching for the great southern continent that we now know as Antarctica, and the Society proposed that an expedition be sent northwards to reach the North Pole. So, this voyage to the North Pole would be led by Constantine Phipps. Now, Phipps was brought into the Navy by his uncle, Augustus Hervey, the third Earl of Bristol. It always helped to have the patronage of someone of such influence. At the rather late age of 15, boys usually entered the Navy at the age of 11 or 12, if they were going to be officers. He studied at Eton alongside Joseph Banks, who was a neighbour and friend and who would, in due course, become president of the Royal Society. Banks had already travelled with Captain Cook on Cook's first voyage of exploration to the Pacific. Constantine Phipps was made a post-captain at the age of 21. In 1768 he became MP for Lincoln and would eventually inherit the family title of Lord Mulgrave. He was rather a jovial character. He had little in the way of good manners at table, apparently. Dr Johnson, Dictionary Johnson, himself not a particularly polite eater, thought Phipps no better than a savage but he was a good captain who took the welfare of his men seriously. Phipps would command the racehorse and Captain Skeffington Ludwig, the consort vessel Carcass. Ludwig was a relative of Lewis Carroll, whose own real name was, you may recall, Charles Ludwig Dodgson. Now here's the proposal, that the two ships would sail to the Shetlands, resupply, then sail directly towards the Pole. Once they found land, an expedition would explore, and then they would return with their findings to great acclaim. Carcass and Racehorse were a type of ship known as bomb vessels. They were called bomb vessels because they were built for bombarding shore defences, and were equipped with two large mortars, placed deep in the ships to keep the centre of gravity low. To take the weight and recoil of the mortars, such ships were heavily built, and it was hoped this would help them survive the ice. Now the ships mustered on the Thames and, at first, it was easy to encourage men to sign up. After all, many were ashore and unemployed because the Navy was actively downsizing, having no wars on at the moment. But then came the call for a quick rearming of the fleet as unrest was growing in the American colonies. The Declaration of Independence by those colonies was only a year away. The fleet, needing sailors urgently and paying a large bounty for signing on, Thirty men deserted Phipps' ships for the money, and the rest of the crew muttered darkly about the injustice of it all. Well, to his credit, Phipps told the Admiralty that this was unfair in his men, and he obtained the same bounty for those who stayed. But there was now no choice but to employ the press. Now, the use of the hated press gang has been somewhat overplayed down the years. The idea that they generally just grabbed any and everybody to man ships is very much an exaggeration. In most cases, the press made a proper rendezvous 
and signed up willing hands and paid a bounty. Just as often, though, vessels would be sent to wait off harbours and requisition men from returning merchant vessels, because it was experienced people who were most needed. It was only at the very height of war, and with significant manpower losses to make up, that a hot press was sent out that would take any man, be he country bumpkin or clerk. So, though still somewhat short of a full muster, they were almost ready to sail. But what did the crew know about the voyage? What had they been told? Well, undoubtedly some knew their true purpose. But some wag, possibly one of the midshipmen or petty officers, told them that they were going to cut off a piece of the North Pole to fashion into a walking stick for the Prince of Wales. Well, nobody would have believed that, I'm sure, but perhaps a few more found the second rumour to be more likely, that they were going to grease the North Pole so that the world would continue to spin and not slow down. The ships would now drop down the Thames past shipyards preparing vessels for the fleet and pick up cannon, powder and shot at Woolwich. Though they were on a scientific mission, they would still go armed. You could never trust Johnny Foreigner, and any people living at the North Pole might be hostile. So on the 15th of June, without any problems to date, the mission arrived in the Shetlands, and they duly resupplied with water and stores, and then they headed a little off north to the Arctic. The crew were issued with fear not jackets and trousers, heavily felted clothing that was the best that could be done against the cold at the time. Often the jackets were painted or tied in the hope of making them somewhat waterproof. It was off the coast of Greenland that they met ships of the Northern Whaling Fleet, busy catching and processing the right whales that they would shortly bring to the brink of extinction. The captains of several of these whalers told Captain Phipps that the ice was as bad this year as they'd ever seen it. The ice cap was further south than ever. You'll not get through, and we will be returning home a month earlier than usual, he was told. Well, Phipps took that information on board, and then proceeded as per instructions. He was, after all, a Royal Navy captain, and the weather did seem quite mild. Before long they were meeting ice on their port side, and so they steered towards the east, eventually coming across land. It was part of Spitsbergen, now known as Prince Charles Island, and Phipps wrote in his journal, The coast appeared to be neither habitable nor accessible. It was formed by high, barren, black rocks without the least mark of vegetation. The valleys between the high cliffs were filled with snow and ice. This prospect would have suggested the idea of perpetual winter, had not the mildness of the weather, the smooth water, bright sunshine, and constant daylight given a cheerfulness and novelty to the whole of this striking and romantic scene. Well, the next day another whaler, the Rockingham, came into view and then alongside. Its captain was astonished to see a warship so far north, and even more amazed to hear of its mission. He confirmed the ice was the worst he'd ever known, and reported that he'd had only six days clear of fog, and that three English and four Dutch whalers had been nipped, that is, crushed in the ice, in this season. North again, now into loose floating ice and mist, and then the sound of waves crashing into something. The ship shortened sail, and the crew strained to see what was in front of them. Well, the mist began to clear, and there, just two hundred yards before them, was a huge cliff of ice barring their path, against which these waves were crashing. The sails shivered, Phipps shouted for the helm to starboard, and racehorse tacked to allow wind to fill the sails, followed by the carcass. They turned eastwards again as the ice mass carved, sending bergs crashing into the sea, creating huge dangers for the ships, of course. Phipps later commended his ship's company because the ship would have been lost had not the officers and men been very alert in working the ship. And they travelled using ice poles to fend off chunks of ice where possible, often being struck by them, which knocked men off their feet, and continually reminded them of the risks they were taking. Whalers rarely went into these waters because of the danger of entrapment. The ice cliff was now behind them, but a low and near continuous shelf of ice still barred the way north and then, virtually without warning, they found the ships fast in the ice. Carcass had already been almost fully surrounded by ice a few days before, and had only escaped by launching the ship's boats to tow the vessel free. Well, this time they had to take the anchors onto the ice, dig them in, and then drag the ships to the anchors, using the capstans, 
before the ice broke away. They had reached 80 degrees 36 north and luckily fell in with some small islands, taking shelter in a cove for a few days and setting up a tent ashore to take celestial observations. But it was just a brief respite. As they set off once more, the temperature dropped alarmingly, with icicles forming on the yard arms. On the 27th of July, a Danish seaman aboard the racehorse died, was stitched into his hammock, and buried at sea with all due ceremony. At one point, the wind fell away, and Phipps sent two officers off in a boat to hunt seahorses, or walrus as we now call them. Isolating one beast from the herd, they opened fire, but only wounded their quarry. Well, the walrus dived under the boat, only to appear on the other side, with a number of others who then proceeded to attack the boat. One oar was wrenched out of a seaman's hand, and using their tusks, the beasts were trying to capsize the craft. Well, just as the battle seemed lost, a boat from the carcass under command of a midshipman appeared, fired on the walrus and drove them off. Now, we're going to hear more about that midshipman in due course. But with regard to the ice, Phipps and Lutwidge both now witnessed the sea beginning to freeze, thus proving that ice could form in a saline solution if the temperature was low enough, and that blew a hole in the theory that the Arctic ice must emanate from freshwater rivers. And Phipps noted in his journal, The scene was beautiful and picturesque, the two ships becalmed, but everywhere surrounded by ice as far as we could see. But this picture was deceptive because the ice had locked them in. Phipps attempted to appear unconcerned, and he let the ship's companies wander onto the ice and play games. But two days later, pressure ridges began to rear up, forcing piles of ice to the height of the main yard. His journal now read, We remained hereabouts until the 1st of August, when the two ships got completely fastened in the ice, occasioned by the loose ice that set in from the sea. This made our situation very dreadful and alarming so that on the seventh day we were in a very great apprehension of having the ship squeezed to pieces. Groaning and cracking from the ice, creaking and moaning from the ship's timbers, parties were set to to dig some of the ice from the ship's side to lessen the pressure. But now we're going to leave them there, trapped in the ice, because in a moment I'll introduce you to a few of the people on board the two vessels. Let me first tell you of the ship's surgeon of the racehorse. Now, as you'll know, ship's surgeons of the period were often poorly trained and little better than butchers. They could whip off a damaged limb, pull a decayed tooth, or stitch a head wound, all without anaesthetic, of course, with very dangerous and unsterilized sets of instruments. Or they could treat you with mercury for a dose of the pox. They could bind up hernias, which were common enough occurrences on ships. They could let blood, or they could give you a pill one ingredient of which could be dog's excrement if the practitioner wasn't up to date with the latest medical ideas. But Dr. Irving was much more than a common sawbones. He was a physician and up to date in his practices. But he was also more than that. He was also a scientist and was testing a method of purifying seawater for consumption. Water on board ships was often a problem. Kept in barrels in the hold, it might be months before it was used time for all sorts of algae and microorganisms to grow, leaving it undrinkable. Or the supply might run out when you were far from land. Now, this invention might alleviate these problems, and it did indeed have a modest success, though with plenty of pure ice around on this voyage, it wasn't really needed. But another of his inventions was a greater success, a heavily insulated bottle that could be lowered into the depths and then opened to collect a specimen of seawater. Accurate temperature gradients of the sea were now possible, and the data from this voyage has been used in the charting of climate change. Dr. Irving's was a very important part of this mission. There was also another scientist on board, one Israel Lyons, an astronomer sent by the Board of Longitude, along with two of the new marine timepieces, one by Arnold and the other by Kendall, a copy of Harrison's number 4 watch, and nautical almanacs that gave daily positions of the planets and stars, which were still on test at this time. Now, using the nautical almanac, you took sun, moon and planetary sightings using a sextant, and then made a calculation of your position from the figures given. With a marine chronometer, you took a sighting with a sextant to work out the time where you were, 
and compare that to local time in your home port with the Greenwich time as shown on the watch, and you therefore calculated your position. So Israel Lines was on board the racehorse dealing with these two longitude methods. The third person that I want to mention is a freed slave. Olada Equiano was there as servant to Dr. Irving. A most interesting person, he'd been taken as a slave from Nigeria to the West Indies as a child and was then sold in Virginia. Bought by a lieutenant in the Royal Navy, he was taken aboard a British warship as the lieutenant's servant. Service in the Royal Navy should have immediately given him his freedom. There were no slaves on board the king's ships, but the lieutenant kept him in slavery even when he returned to England. He was then resold and taken to the island of Montserrat. Sold yet again, his new masters let him by his own freedom, and he'd therefore gone through many adventures and different hands before ending up on the racehorse. He'd educated himself and learnt to play the French horn, which allowed him a source of income. At a time when the wearing of wigs was de rigueur, he learnt to dress hair and was in demand. Of his own volition, he voyaged to North America and to the Eastern Mediterranean. Needless to say, in London he was part of the abolitionist movement. He was involved with the publicising of the details of the Zong incident, where a cargo of slaves had been drowned so that the slave ship's owners could claim insurance on lost cargo. That case and the court proceedings that followed were part of the story in the recent film, Bell. He wrote to the papers and finally published his autobiography, his interesting narrative, in 1789 to great acclaim, and it's still in print today as a Penguin classic. Equiano finally settled down in London, married an Englishwoman, Susanna Cullen, and had a number of children. What a wonderful story for an ex-slave. He died in 1797. Now you remember my story of the midshipman who saved a ship's boat from a walrus attack. Well, that same midshipman had another adventure. It was while the ships were trapped in the ice that this 14-year-old midshipman from the carcass went out onto the ice with a musket to bag himself a polar bear. It was misty. Finding one coming towards him, he tried to fire the musket, but it flashed in the pan. And then the mist lifted and he could be seen from the ship. With the bear now close, the midshipman grabbed the musket by the barrel, ready to take a whack at the animal. But on board the ship, a cannon was fired which scared off the bear. Back on board the carcass, the midshipman was summoned to Captain Lutwidge's great cabin for a dressing down. When Lutwidge demanded what the devil did he think he was doing, the boy replied that, I wish, sir, to get a skin for my father. One can imagine Lutwidge finding it difficult to suppress a smile at this. Well, that midshipman was a young Horatio Nelson, and it was he that saved the boat from the walrus attack. Now, if the story of the polar bear attack is true, and I do seriously doubt it, it was only told by Lutwidge in later years when Nelson was already considered a hero. It would, however, be consistent with the fact that Nelson never seemed to understand the concept of fear. But now, back to the ice. The situation of the ship seemed to be getting worse by the day. There was little sign that the ice would open to let them pass, and the Arctic winter might only be a few weeks away. The digging of a channel out was out of the question, and spirits were flagging in the excessive cold. Phipps and Ludwig had a discussion. Part of the ballast taken on board at the beginning of the cruise included a large number of bricks, so that if they had to, they could build shelters on land in which to spend the winter. But they didn't now have the food resources to do this, so decided that preparations should be made to abandon the vessels and get to open water. Now, both racehorse and carcass were equipped with four boats of various sizes. Each had a yawl, cutter, longboat and jolly boat, and each of these had a demountable mast and sails, in addition to oars. They would have to be dragged to open sea several miles away. They would be very crowded, especially with the amount of food and equipment they would have to carry but it seemed the only way. The boats were hoisted out onto the ice. Eighty canvas bags were made to carry 25 pounds of bread each, and 200 joints of beef were cooked for the journey. Harnesses were made for teams to drag the boats over the ice. And then Phipps did a trial run, 50 men towing one boat for two miles. The system worked well. 
while insisting that each man carry a bag of bread, musket and ammunition, Phipps decreed they should only take the clothes they were wearing. Midshipman Thomas Floyd immediately went below and put on me two shirts, two waistcoats, two pairs of breeches, four pairs of stockings, a pair of boots and a good hat. I likewise put in my pockets a comb, raise a pocket book with letters and notes for my journal. He then turned back to put on a red woolen cap under his hat. The launch was now pulled three miles, but the ships were drifting in the ice, and the following day actually drifted past the launch. Phipps ordered the boats to be hoisted back on board. On the 10th of August, the sails began to flap and fill. The ships gathered way, and were surging through the cracking ice. They had some hard knocks, and even snapped an anchor, but by noon, against all the odds, they'd broken out of the ice. After a few days' rest and recuperation amongst Dutch whalers sheltering in Spitsbergen Bay, on the 19th of August they finally turned for home, only to run into a gale such as none of them had witnessed before. Now these bomb vessels were not known as good sea boats, they were slow and sluggish. Taking on water at every plunge of the ships, the pumps were manned 24 hours round to keep them afloat. A great wall of water fell on racehorse and swept away the ship's boats. The deck itself began to split open, such was the force of the sea. They even stood the risk of crashing into the coast of Norway. But finally the storm cleared, and on the 13th of October they were safely back in the Thames. It had been a mammoth and perilous voyage, and even though they'd failed to grease the pole, they had recorded a position further north than any previous expedition. They'd also information that confirmed that seawater could freeze which would eventually dispel the theory that there were solid land and freshwater rivers at the pole. They had important climatic and oceanographic information for the scientists to ponder over. But there are other legacies of the voyage, one in place names. To the north of Spitsbergen there is Phipsoya, or Phipps Island, and other islands named after members of the crew. And there's this chap. Not just remembered for the famous picture of Nelson and the polar bear, but here for another reason, because its full Latin name is Ursa Maritimus Phipps. It was Captain Constantine Phipps who gave the full first description of the polar bear and its habits, and it is all but forgotten that the species still carries his name. Now Constantine Phipps went on to become a senior captain, leaving the Navy at the end of the American War of Independence, Lutheridge eventually rose to the position of Admiral. Nelson was now on his rise to glory. The polar bear was not at all concerned that he'd been given a new name. <laughs> <laughs>